I want to show a group of parents and grandparents Hi everyone, come on down How the amount of drugs we're giving our kids from cold remedies to antidepressants is going through the roof So I want to get your help to show the difference between the amount of medication we give these days compared to how much we used to give in the year that I was born so in the late 70s By talking to paediatricians and using official figures I've worked out how many doses of medicine two classes of 20 kids would take before they're 18 years old. The first class was born, like me, in the 1970s. In the 70s, I can't even remember what there was. There wasn't much, was there? I don't remember them having any for cough and colds, actually. I think... Well, what did you guys used to do? Didn't they never get coughed and colds? They sneezed. They sneezed. <laughs> Then we line up pills for a very different class, full of kids born today. I throw in the tablets, so whatever you need put in, I, I prescribe, I become a home doctor. The line of pills for today's class immediately races ahead of the one born 40 years ago. It's alarming. Mm. Is it? But yeah, yeah, it's alarming. Overall, we're giving our kids an astounding three and a half times more medicine than we were when I was growing up. It's pretty staggering, isn't it? Yeah. Are you surprised? No, yeah. Shut I think it's worth saying that some of the medicines that we're giving here to kids will save lives, but what it's worth remembering is that all medicines do harm, all drugs do harm, without exception. And most of the time, we hope that the benefit outweighs the harm. I want to look at whether we're getting this balance right with the prescription drugs we're giving to kids with behavioural problems. But first, I want to look at a popular over-the-counter medicine that parents may be wasting too much of their hard-earned cash on. So it's not till you become a parent that you're aware, really, of this huge industry selling stuff to parents and, and young kids. The one that outsells all the others is a sticky pink liquid packed with paracetamol. What's your biggest selling kids medication? Out Calpol. of everything, it's Calpol. Really? really? What about the non-branded, uh, like the generic paracetamol suspension? Very rarely asked for. Really? No. Have you got any? No. Really? We just stopped it's the Calpol. It's that popular? It's that popular. OK. Calpol has 70% of the market for pain and fever relief in kids. In 2016, we spent a staggering £64 million on it. So does Britain have a Calpol problem? I've come to Lincolnshire to meet one of its many self-confessed fans. Hi. Hi. Hi, I'm Charlotte. Charlotte. Great to meet you. Thanks so much for having me. Come on me. in. Hi. Hi. And who are you? This is Felicity. <laughs> Hi, Felicity. Do you want to give me five? <laughs> See? Oh. OK, so no broken bones while I'm here, please. <laughs> How do you guys deal in general with all those little... Aches and pains. And aches and Calpol is definitely the, the wonder drug. Yeah. for, uh, for really? teething. We have more than, more than our fair share of syringes in the cupboard. Loads of them. The syringes. It's possibly this even is... more. It's a bit scary how much we've, we've bought. <laughs> I make that about 18, give and or that's take. That's just the downstairs ones. That's just the downstairs ones. There yeah. are, there's more upstairs. Well, yeah, because I... there's nothing worse than having to run down. <laughs> find one. That is, we, have, we have bottles everywhere. Really? Oh, Cracker wow. Bottle. Just, just in case. It's really hard to comfort her if there's anything wrong. How does she feel about the, uh, the cow pole? Uh, she's she's just started asking for it. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. she's, uh, good to say, she's not a, not a great sleeper and at night, if she doesn't want to go to bed, we go through the whole repertoire of, I need a wee, need a poo, cow pole, <laughs> I need something. Let's go look around the house, see if we can find any more. Here we go. So, yeah. This one's pretty full. Yeah, that must be a fairly new one. Another bottle of ibuprofen. One more syringe. So Probably let's more. say it's sort of 
at a conservative estimate, <laughs> somewhere between 25 and 30 bottles. In uh, 23 months. In 23 months, yeah. So it's a bottle, good going, a bottle isn't it? a month. It's kind of a bottle of a month. I don't feel we use it all the time. It's not, right, it's bedtime, we'll brush your teeth and here's some cowpole and off you go to bed. So I know it's not a routine in that sense, so I don't feel bad in that way, but it does make me question when we've used that much. Wow, I mean, that, that was not what I was expecting. They're using a massive amount of cowpole. But it, it shows to me, like, if this is what normal parents, what good, really good parents are doing, you know, this is a huge part of our parenting culture. This cowpole is how we bring up our kids. But how worried should we be about the amount of drugs we're giving to our children? I'm meeting doctor and former president of the Royal College of GPs. Hi. Thanks so much for seeing me. Nice to meet you. Dr Iona Heath. I'm a new dad. It feels to me like we're giving out quite a lot of medication to our kids. Is this actually a problem? Almost certainly, yes. We are establishing a pattern of behaviour for the children that what's wrong with them can be treated by something that comes out of a bottle. Difficulty, medication. Difficulty, medication. How do drug companies exploit that, though? Because there are diagnoses written down in manuals. There are two main areas in which it's easy to play on parental fear. One is the crying baby, and the other is the misbehaving child. So you've got the crying child, that's the, that's the vulnerable stage that I'm at at the moment with Lyra. And then there's behavioural difficulties, which are going to come later. Each generation, it seems to me, since 1945, has more faith and more enthusiasm for medicine taking. And we have to break this cycle that medicines are always the answer to a child's problem. If Dr Heath is right, then this is a way bigger problem than I'd thought. One of the areas where medication rates have increased the most is treating kids' behavioural problems. Well, probably the best example is ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, where between 2000 and 2015, we've seen an 800% increase in prescriptions. I want to understand why parents turn to medication for their kids. Hello. Hi. So what's your name? Eleanor. Eleanor. And what do people call you? Ellie? Elle? <coughs> Stink. <it>? Stink. <laughs> and who's this with you? Mummy. Mummy. Hi, Mummy. Hi. Hi. It's J Jenny, is that right? Yeah, it is. Great to meet you. Thank Eleanor, you. Do, you, do you want to show me your house then? Yeah. Come on, let's have a look. Up here. Eight-year-old Eleanor has been taking medication for her ADHD for two years. Ah! Ah! <laughs> this is the loudest Lego session I've ever had. Ah! <laughs> um, Daisy! Here, look, look, come on, come on, focus, focus. She's scared. She ran away. Ah! Daisy! No, no, leave Daisy, leave Daisy. When Eleanor was six, Jenny realised she couldn't cope with her extreme distractibility. Her behaviour was just really bad, to the point where she would hit me, kick me, throw chairs at me. Walking home from school, she's clinging to lampposts, throwing her shoes in the road, running off the other direction. And it's only a 10-minute walk up the road. So... Your life was unbelievably exhausting and difficult. Yeah. Eventually, the doctors recommended medication. It seemed to help. <laughs> and Eleanor's been taking pills most days ever since. Hi, Mum! Do you want it? Eleanor, <laughs> can, I, can I have to go for a second? Because I want to ask you, it's a really important question for me. Don't I have dinosaurs. I have dinosaurs. So I really, I really want to understand from you what it's like having attention deficit disorder. If I come down to your level, that's a bit easier. <laughs> <laughs> so what's, what's, it, what's it like? Dinosaur. Is he OK? He's OK. He's OK. Do you want some? <laughs> Eleanor, tell me, what's it, what's it like? Oh, they're hairy. <laughs> Is this what it's like? 
Is it hard for you to answer the question? Yes. Why? <laughs> because I'm giving you goo. But why is it hard for you to, to just listen to me and answer the question? I uh -huh. Do you get bored? No, I get goo. So try and answer my question. Just give me five seconds of your time. What's it like? It's like... bad. And what, why is it bad? Is it frustrating? Yes, when Mummy's angry at me. But why do you... Why do you cause Mummy gets angry because you find it hard to do what she says, don't you? Yes. Why do you find it hard to do things that people want it's you to do? It's a bit more dirty. It's fine. I don't care. Oh, yeah, yeah. Listen to Chris. I don't know. Why is it hard? Is it really hard? It's really hard for you to try and answer my question, isn't it? Yeah, blobby. Sausage. Sausage! I think I've probably got the answer to my question. Playing with goo. ADHD is the most common behavioural condition in kids. And it covers a wide range of different symptoms. Hi, I'm Chris. Hi, Hi Chris, nice to meet you. I'm Fiona. Hi, Fiona. Tom's given his drugs for highly impulsive and sometimes aggressive behaviour, particularly at school. What's the hardest thing about school for you? Lunch time is probably the hardest for me. Really? Yeah. Why? Because I don't eat. Why? Because of my medication. Oh, so you can't eat? No, I can, but it doesn't make me hungry. OK, so the pills stop you feeling hungry. Yeah. In the UK, more than 60,000 children are now taking drugs for ADHD. How's that? It's good. And 90% of them are on methylphenidate often known as Ritalin. Goodbye! Goodbye. <laughs> you have a good day at school. Oh, well. Can I look at the yeah. side effects on the drugs? Possible side effects. Oh, there you go. This no, is always on. interesting. <laughs> right. So common is uneven heartbeat and mood changes, mood swings or changes of personality. I mean, that's a, for me, that's a big old deal. 10% of people, changes in personality. I mean, you know, that's changes in the core of who you are. He's described it as the fun being sucked out of him. Everything's quite grey and dull. And you can sometimes see it. It's almost like a, a grey cloud comes over his head and he's very... He's dulled down, which, of course, is the point in the medication, but it's really sad to see. Methylphenidate boosts the brain chemical dopamine. It does seem to help some symptoms of ADHD in the short term, but it also suppresses appetite, so it can stunt children's growth. And then the non-serious ones, very common, headache, feeling nervous, not being able to sleep. I mean, you know, food and sleep are two of the pretty important ingredients for the life of a 10-year-old, aren't they? Absolutely. So then you've got a tired boy with ADHD <laughs> who's hungry. I'm convinced there must be a different way to help these kids. I can't find much that's scientifically backed here in the UK, so I search further afield. I found a, a professor at the University of Amsterdam, Susan Bogle, she's a psychologist, and she has developed a mindfulness programme specifically for kids with ADHD. Quite an ambitious thing to do. But her initial data, her initial results, look really promising. Mindfulness is a form of meditation, all about paying attention to the present moment. I get that it sounds a bit airy-fairy, but it's supported by good scientific evidence and is now being used by the NHS to treat chronic pain and depression. The world's only course tailored to kids with ADHD has been developed by Professor Bogles. I'm very excited to meet her, partly because she's a world expert, and I'm really excited by what, some of what she's published, but also because I can't imagine what she must be like as a person. I mean, who would ever take on the challenge of trying to teach kids with ADHD mindful meditation? I recognise you. Hi, Susan, Hi. Professor Vogels. It's lovely Hi, to meet Susan. you. I'm Chris. Along with her colleague, Dr. De Bryn, okay. Professor Vogels has agreed to run her treatment here in the UK for the first time. Six children have signed up. Tom and Eleanor will be joined by Matty. Matty, be careful, please. 
Oliver? I just sit up here and enjoy the view. Who wants to come up? Kai. And Mason. Ah! Go take your tablet. Okay. Mason started taking methylphenidate 15 months ago after difficulties at school. He would do silly things at school, like running off to the toilet or staying in assembly and refusing to move. At the end of the day, I'd be called over. Mason got sent to the head teacher today. I was desperate, so I took him to the doctor. Straight away, it was medication. Need to go on medication. I was a bit dubious about it. I didn't want him to do it. I wanted other ways to manage it. I'm hoping mindfulness could be that alternative. What was people's response when you said you wanted to do this? So, at that time, and that was back in 2000, uh, the child psychiatrist at the department I was working really thought I was a bit mad because they thought, no, you cannot get a child with such severe attention problems to meditate. That's the most difficult thing for a child or an adolescent with ADHD. I think for, for, for yeah. obvious reasons. Yeah. <laughs> Are you nervous about today then, now, either of you? Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Bogles is giving the group six sessions of mindfulness training. After that, they'll put it fully into practice and see if they feel they still need the drugs. Hi, Eleanor. So come on up. Hi, Mason. Come on through. Hi, Matty. Hi, Tom. Both the mums and their kids will be taught mindfulness techniques. Let's all find a place. The key is to get them to calmly focus on the sensations they're experiencing. So now we're going to do our first silent meditation in two minutes. Let's start. Let's try it. I ring the bell. The children need to sit still and in silence on their mats for two full minutes. Sit like a king or a queen. No small ask for six kids with severe ADHD. <laughs> the back is straight. Shoulders relaxed. Okay, so sit. <laughs> Esther, I need a bit of your help because now I notice I have difficulty concentrating because everybody's talking or doing other things. Okay, guys, let a nice circle. I think it's time for a break. Yes, break. Break. Was this just unusually terrible, or is this quite normal? Um, I think it's... I've had easier groups. And most of it was just this, what felt like a disaster to me. Right. And I, I started, I didn't like... I stopped liking the children, some yes. of them. And then yes. I didn't care if they were, they got better. I yeah. just wanted it to end. Yes, yes. So imagine how the parents will feel. If we already have that after being one and a half hour with them, imagine how hard it can be at home. You see? Or imagine how hard it can be for a teacher for them. Yeah. It doesn't feel like a great start. I just hope the kids stick with it. Our baby Lyra is eight weeks old. Uh, nappies, wet wipes, socks. And it's time for her first jabs. Many of our friends with babies have suggested giving her infant paracetamol, or Calpol, afterwards. Right, baby. <laughs> oh, baby, that's fine. So that's one pop up. I wonder what the principal GP of our local surgery, Dr. Marlowe, makes of the drug. 
I, I don't know if, if you feel the same way. I, I, I suppose I have a sort of um, mild concern about giving the, the Calpol or the, the paracetamol. And I, I know it's safe and it no, will probably well, help. Actually, no, I wouldn't completely agree with you there. Really? We, we have children now who are almost addicted to paracetamol, to Calpol. I don't think that they're addicted to the drug itself, but they're addicted to that process. And, and I think what's quite interesting is there's some families in whom it's not, they're not using it for pain, they're not using it for, for temperature, for high fevers. They're using it because there is actually a psychological distress. Part of the ritual that is developed between parent and child, carer and child, is to give a drug. And paracetamol is probably, Calpol, is probably the most popular and has become, you know, some, some people disparage and describe it as the heroine of childhood. Don't get me wrong, I think we need to use it when appropriate. But we could use a lot less. We could use a lot less. It seems we're not only teaching our kids from a very young age that drugs can solve our problems, but we're also wasting our cash on Calpol when we don't even need it. I'm determined not to fall into the same trap. But, a few hours later, I'm forced to think again. She was boiling hot and crying in a way that we hadn't seen before. It was really screaming. You know, it, it plugs into something deep in your, in your brain where the desire to fix the problem is just overwhelming. We gave Calpol. And it worked. You certainly went straight to sleep. Stupidly, I just underestimated the power of a, of a crying child. I'm starting to realise how vulnerable parents are, and I wonder how much this is taken advantage of. I found some ads from a few years ago for the nation's most popular kids' drug. It seems to suggest giving a drug for every little problem. Now, with a little help from Calpol, they're back to their normal selves. So what I think these ads are doing is they're creating this really narrow definition of what normal is, where any deviation, a little bit of illness, a little bit of being a bit under the weather, you need a spoonful of Calpol. Then, I come across something unexpected on YouTube leading brand in paediatric allergies. This doesn't seem to be an ad. This seems to be like the corporate presentation. The presentation explains how an advertising agency has marketed Calpol to successfully boost sales. Break category codes by placing more emphasis on the emotional versus the functional benefits of the products. That explains a lot of those ads, which totally plug into your emotions, you know, the naked admission that we're not doing it because it works well, we're, we're going to do it by manipulating people's emotions. We're not going to give them facts, we're going to give them feelings. Tea with household appliances. Of course, all parents want to make things okay for their kids. But instead of emotional manipulation, what we need is clear facts about when the drugs are actually necessary. It makes me feel very angry that you can sell drugs in the same way that you talk about toys and food and sweets. It's not a sweet, it's not fun, and it's not necessary in most of the instances that they're talking about it. I want to meet the makers of Calpol, Johnson & Johnson, and ask them if they feel their marketing is appropriate. It's a few days since the chaotic start of the mindfulness treatment. The kids were asked to meditate at home every day for two minutes. And I've come to check on how Eleanor's getting along. At night. I can't believe Eleanor is going to come out of school today, go home and do two minutes of meditation. Like that, that, I will have to see to believe it. It's very nice to see you. Well, I, Mum told me you were coming. 
How many times in the last, I don't know, year has she sat still, quietly with her eyes shut, doing nothing but awake? Only when last... she's ill. So that's once maybe a year. Friday she was tired after school, so we didn't get a chance really to do the meditation. Then Saturday she was tired again. And then Sunday she actually sat there and done her meditation. Done really? Done two minutes, no problems. How many minutes? Two minutes, no problems, which was very surprising. It's early days, but I'm thrilled they're actually giving it a go. So tell me what to do, because I don't know what to do. Well, you all can I listen to that. OK. And you'll know what to do. You need to sit straight. And your shoulders have to relax. Sitting like a king or a queen with your back straight. Shoulders relaxed. In a moment, the bell will ring. And when you cannot hear it anymore, you can open your eyes. That was a great, that was a great, that was a great effort. That was a great effort. Hey, sit down now, sit down now. That was a really good effort. So listen, hold on, talk to me about that for one second. So you have to wait till the end of the bell, not the beginning of the bell. So what are you going to do tonight? I have to keep my eyes closed. Till the, when, until when? Uh, 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 we're paying attention. Until when? Until the bell stops. A week later, I visit Tom. With your arms by your side. He's not finding the mindfulness easy. How's the week at school? Good. Get, any events you got to tell me about? I had one today. You had one today? Yeah. What happened today? Well, one of these boys were annoying me. I went over to him and I whacked him in the face. I just hit him really hard and his face was red. This feels like quite a big deal. Mm. I don't always want to be hitting people. I was hoping the mindfulness by now might be working a bit. Mindfulness isn't a quick fix, and Tom agrees to keep trying. Meditation three, breathing space. But for Becky and Mason, practising the exercises has become a highlight of their day. Good day. Yeah, go. We managed to master it. We've done it. We've mastered it. How would you feel? Calm. Calm. I'm joining them on the school run to find out if all this hard work is making any difference to Mason's progress at school. Hi, morning. Mr Armstrong, this is Chris. Chris nice to meet you Armstrong. Doing. What's it like being his, being his teacher? I've been finding that he's extremely more focused from doing this meditation. He definitely wants to be well behaved, especially with the behaviour ladder that we have in our school. So that's our behaviour policy. And he generally wants to get started the day every morning. Sometimes I come in, I'm aiming for gold today, or I'm aiming for star today. And I'm like, let's get to here, Mason, let's see if you get there. You got ground normal, you got silver, good. You got gold, really good. You got star day, excellent. So for you, is, it, is there a different quality to the, doing the meditation compared to taking the medication? We've given him medication, it's just like, oh, there you go, there's your tablet, there's your drink, take that, that's it. Whereas with meditation, I'm having to be more involved with him. We've got a stronger bond now, because I feel like I've been there his whole life and I've helped him as much as I can, but part of me feels like I wasn't actually there. Because I just, I, I tried to keep him away as much as possible because it just made me so angry all the time. And I feel bad for that, because I don't have those memories. What about now? Do you feel... Is that changing? Definitely. Since, and it's not even since medication, because there's obviously times when we still fall out, but since meditation, since going to these sessions, it's like, it's given us that mum and son time that I didn't even know we needed it, but we needed it. Really? And it's the time that we have, it's, it's calm. I feel like I wish I had this bond from day one.
While the kids continue working on their mindfulness, I want to find out when we should and shouldn't use infant paracetamol or Calpol. After seeing how its makers have been using marketing that I believe plays on parents' emotions, I've come to the Children's Emergency Department at Leicester Royal Infirmary to get some facts. Consultant paediatrician Dr Damien Rowland deals with sick kids and their anxious parents every day. Major staff base morning, guys. <laughs> One of the things parents worry about most is fever. And he's got a temperature of for almost 41, so a really stonking temperature. That really frightens me. In and of itself, whether it's 38, 39, 40, really that probably doesn't matter much. But isn't a very high temperature just by itself doing him harm? Uh, no, uh, really? essentially, it's not. It's the body's trying to remove uh, the, the, the virus or whatever's causing it. So let me explain. When children get an infection, one of the things they can do to fight it is to raise their body temperature, because lots of bugs don't grow well at high temperatures. And children's bodies are really good at doing this. They can massively ramp up their body temperature to very high levels for short periods of time, just long enough to zap the bugs. And as a parent watching that child, it can be really frightening. But we don't necessarily want to try and reduce that body temperature using a drug because we'll be stopping the body doing the thing that it needs to do. There's still one thing that concerns me and I'm sure other parents. The risk of fits or convulsions. But if a child's got a fever and, and you can reduce that fever with paracetamol, surely that does reduce the risk of a convulsion? Uh, you think so, but it doesn't. So we, we, we know from a number of studies that if you're regularly giving paracetamol to stop you getting any temperature at all, the child still probably has a, a convulsion if they're going to have one anyway. So a fever itself is not harmful. Treating a high fever with paracetamol will not reduce the risk of seizures. And we should treat the child, not the temperature. That's exactly it. If a child is under three months old, or their fever has been going on for five days, or there are any other symptoms that as a parent you're worried about, you should seek medical advice. Back home, my bottle of Calpol lists two main uses. The first one, pain, is fair enough. It's the second that I have an issue with. On this packet, it clearly says in several places that one of the main uses for Calpol is for treating a fever. But I have here the national guidelines on how to treat fever in children. And they clearly say, do not use drugs like Calpol with the sole aim of reducing body temperature in children with fever. What the guideline does say is that you can consider using a drug like Calpol if the child has fever and distress, but parents are really good at telling when their children are distressed. So imagine if it said that on the packet. We'd give a lot less Calpol. I've been trying to meet Johnson & Johnson to talk about their marketing campaign. And now I'm more determined than ever to have a discussion. In terms of timing, the next few weeks would be ideal. That feels good, feels positive. But my early hopes for a meeting... What we need is a decision saying yes or no, we will or we will not do an interview. Quickly fade. Just voicemail. Uh, it would be nice to hear from you still. I'll hope to hear from you soon. Bye-bye. Well, that is disappointing. I feel it's important to get the facts out there about when we don't need to use Calpol. So I've hatched a plan to talk directly to parents. So, Tom, bit of an odd request. What I'd like is 2,610 of these bottles filled with water. Can, can you do that? I would think we'd help you out with that, Chris, yes. This family dairy is going to help give my message some punch. Can I press the button? Yep. It's like endless bottle. From the UK sales figures, I've worked out the amount of cowpole that we buy. It's a massive quantity. 
but one we can all relate to because most of us have a bottle like that in our fridge full of milk. 2,610 exactly for you, wow. first. A shot of colour is the final step in my plan to deliver some fever facts whilst presenting a surprise. I wasn't exactly sure if this would work, but that looks pretty good, doesn't it? I'm quite impressed by that. And the question I want to put to people is how long does it take us to buy all this cowpole that we're making here? Ah, brilliant. That is perfect, guys. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> I bring my 5,000 litres of look-alike Kelpol to a popular day out for young families. An autumn fair in the middle of Bristol. Five and a bit tons of pink goo. I'm not trying to tell parents, you're doing everything wrong, I'm judging you, it's your fault. I'm saying this is the world we live in. This is, this is a situation created by Lots of forces, but corporations are a big part of it. I'm hoping this will make sure Britain's hard-working parents don't waste their money giving their kids drugs they don't need. I think it is going to really stagger people when they find out how much time it takes us to buy this, this volume. OK, we've got ten minutes to the great pink goo show. Can you hear me all right? Hold on, I'll turn it up. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK, so you're coming in ten minutes? Yeah. Are you guys coming? Who's coming to the Dr Chris pink goo display? We've got a massive quantity of it. OK, anyone else coming over? We're about to start. I'm here. You're here? Well, I guess we can just get on with it then. Hi, Hi everyone! Hi. What we've got here is 5.2 tonnes of stuff that is meant to represent cowpole, so 5,220 litres. My question to you is how long does it take the good people of Britain to buy this much cowpole? A thousand weeks. A thousand weeks, so roughly 20 years. <laughs> what do you think? A year. A you think year. a year? You think this takes think about a year? Um, what do you think? A month. You think this is a month, OK. Well, the answer is it takes us, in Britain, one day. So I want to I surround everything I'm about to say by saying I'm a new parent and that this isn't about being judgmental. So what reasons have you used it for? You, you guys there, the, the, the young lady in the blue top. To stop um, things hurting. To stop things hurting, so for pain relief. Well, I think he's got a bit of a temperature. Bit of a temperature, yeah. bit of a fever. OK, so that's probably one of the main causes. Calpol says that it's for the relief of fever. But I want to help parents judge when it's OK not to treat a fever. Fever on its own is not a reason to give paracetamol suspension or Calpol. And in fact, the only reason to give Calpol or paracetamol suspension is to treat the child if they're distressed or in pain. And the guidelines say if the child's distressed, then you can consider using a paracetamol suspension. I wonder how my message has gone down. I am still in shock with, with what all you said, that the, this quantity is bought in one day. I'm still in shock. It's quite a lot, isn't it? Yes. It's quite I like a lot. the taste of it, but I, like, I just like the taste of it. I don't really know what it did to me until today. Do you think you would think twice before having some cowpole now? Yeah, I definitely would. Really? I think after today, there are going to be quite a few families who were previously maybe treating a fever. They would have reached for the liquid paracetamol. I think maybe they won't now. And that'll be great. So you might be wondering, what do the manufacturers of Calpol have to say about all this? Well, so am I, because I did my absolute best to get them to meet me, and they wouldn't. And it makes me furious. They have helped to create a culture where Calpol is seen as a normal, important part of every child's life. And as a result, we're giving it in enormous quantities, and often unnecessarily. So they wouldn't meet me, but they did send me this reply. 
We strongly refute any suggestion that the information we provide to parents is inadequate. All CalPol labelling and advertising is compliant with relevant UK regulations and codes of practice, and we provide very clear guidance as to what conditions CalPol can be used to treat in line with the product licence. But at least a few families are thinking a bit differently. It was a remedy that I used to go for all the time. However, with the little extra knowledge in the bin, to be honest, my mum's thing that she makes at home works quicker than that. So since the last time we saw you, some things have changed. In terms of Calpol use, I think the amount we use in the house has dropped hugely. The first stage of Professor Bogle's mindfulness training is almost over. Today, she'll teach the families the final exercises. Then they'll be ready to move on to phase two, deciding if they want to use meditation in place of the drugs. Yeah, I haven't really seen everyone together for six weeks. So today is the day I want some, I don't know about proof, but yeah, some, some good evidence that this is working well for, for these families, that it's having a real, tangible benefit. The kids are paying much more attention to the training. Some do still find it challenging. But a clear sign of progress for one child in particular would give me real hope it could go on to take the place of the drugs. Do you remember how to ring the bells? Yeah, you hold them real gently. Gently. Six weeks ago, Eleanor was so distractible she even struggled to answer a simple question. Okay. Now it's possible that while we're meditating, we're going to get distracted by someone coming in. And maybe you hear sounds around us that are a bit distracting. If that happens, well done for noticing being distracted and then just bring the attention back. To breathing again. Every time you get distracted by doors opening, maybe you can feel someone walking. Well done for noticing that you are distracted and then bring back the attention to breathing again. Keeping your eyes closed. Really? <laughs> I was trying not to look. You did an amazing job. Well done, Eleanor. That was a big meditation. How was that for you? It was a bit hard knowing you were coming. <laughs> but look at what a great job you did. And you know what? I thought you'd, um, I thought you'd like leap up at the end. That's what you would have done six, six mm -hmm. weeks ago. You would have leapt up and you'd be. <laughs> you know, running around. I think you're still sitting there. <laughs> Tell you what, can I give one lady a hug? Yes. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Do you want a hug too? It's very nice to see you. It's very nice to see you. I'm amazed by the new calmness and focus of these kids compared to the chaos of their first session. We're just chilling and drawing. Yeah, dinosaur. <laughs> dinosaur. Unlike some drugs, it's not normally dangerous to take a break from pills for ADHD. So I'm hoping some of the mums feel ready to rely on mindfulness instead of the meds. Has it changed any of the way you feel about the medication? Is it, does anyone think they want to reduce or try a day off or...? Yeah. Definitely. You, you think I wanna, you're going to try yeah, that with? definitely. But I'm going to start, first of all, with a school day. I'm going to trial him with just doing meditation and no medication. <laughs> and then they can come back to me and let me know how it went. I think even if I could just get him off for one day a week, 
And that's a big step, and that's what I'd, I'd like in the long run. A day of school without meds will be a real test for Mason. I think for me it's not as simple as kind of either or, definitely not. I, I think that it might mean that we could lessen it at some point, but I think um, at the moment, I think it's medication and meditation. Yeah, and we know what we're doing with the medication. So are you going to stick with it? With the meditation, yeah, but also along with the medication, because uh, I don't think i will be able to cope. I can understand why most of these mums want to stick with the drugs. They do seem to help in the short term, and they feel it will help their kids succeed at school. But given the seriousness of the side effects, I can't believe the drugs are really a long-term solution. I've come to Lincoln to speak to a consultant child psychiatrist. Dr Sami Tamimi is also concerned about treating ADHD with pills, although he does occasionally prescribe them for short-term use. So you're not anti the drugs full stop? No, I'm not. I'm not. But the way we're thinking about medication flies in the face of the evidence. Because if you look at the evidence from the studies that we do have available in terms of particularly long-term outcomes, People who take these uh, medications for years, there is no evidence that they have any extra benefits, either in peer relationships, in behaviour at home, in academic achievement. We've got very little evidence that we're leading to any improved outcomes for these kids, and more evidence that we're exposing them to unnecessary harms. And it almost feels to me like this is the modern equivalent of peddling snake oils. Dr Tamimi has prompted me to dig deeper into the research on these drugs. Take a look at this. This is a report that examines all of the trials that have been done testing methylphenidate for treatment of ADHD in children. It says that the quality of the trials is very low. Most of them last for an average of 75 days, which is way shorter than the drug is used for in the real world. It concludes, we cannot say for sure whether taking methylphenidate will improve the lives of children and adolescents with ADHD. So why on earth are we giving this drug out in such huge quantities? Well, I think the answer is here. These are the national guidelines for treating children with ADHD. And despite this report on all of that published evidence, the focus of the guideline is still about using drugs as the go-to treatment in children with ADHD. To find out why, I've come to meet someone who was on the committee that wrote the guidelines, Professor of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, Emily Simonoff. I start by asking if she's worried that the evidence for using the drugs is based on such short trials. The evidence is not of the quality we would like, but it does show a benefit. In the of, short term. In the short term. And the risk of not recommending intervention is that individuals who are suffering from ADHD will miss out on treatments um, that may benefit them. But we're giving these drugs, which we know are powerfully psychoactive and they have effects on, on the body, um, and we're giving them for many, many years. Long-term follow-ups of children on medication suggest that growth may be suppressed by about a centimeter, uh, two centimeters, excuse me. Um, so over, about, about an inch. Uh, yeah, and the view of the guideline committee was that the, the benefit of um, you know, having better academic attainment, better peer, family, um, and intimate relationships was outweighed by that sort of um, uh, long-term sort of uh, effect on stature. Except we, the evidence for that benefit over the long term is weak. Yes, and that is where we are looking at clinical, um, you know, clinical experience 
and we did have to use clinical experiences, which is why guidelines um, do involve a committee. So what Professor Simonoff is saying is that in the experience of the people on the guideline committee, these drugs work, and so they keep recommending them, and I don't think that's good enough. And you've got to remember, these are drugs with serious side effects. They stunt growth, they suppress appetite, they can stop children sleeping. But most importantly, there's no good scientific evidence that they work when they're given in the long term to treat children with ADHD. How are you feeling, Mason? Good. Good? Still feel quite calm? Yeah. Good. Mason's about to try his first day at school without drugs in nearly 18 months. And Becky's realised the stakes are higher than ever. Recently, I found out he's shorter than what he should be. He hasn't really grown. I always thought he was fine but I saw him in PE, he's one of the shortest in the class. And he's always been a big child, so to see that he's obviously stunted his growth a little bit. Excuse I believe in you, I think you can do it. Mm. <laughs> Lip slick. Cheek of it. Got high hopes. <laughs> I'd like to say I've got high hopes, but I haven't. I'm... By the time I arrive, I'm amazed to see Mason's already settled well into his morning classes. Mason, yeah? we're using what we did yesterday to help us uh, work out some complicated multiplication questions, yeah? OK. 240. Yes, 240. And then... Off you go. What have you learned today? I'm just saying taking my tablet as well as not taking it, I think. But no, 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 because the side effects, the side effects of my tablet make me less hungry. So the only difference for you today is that you've got more hunger? Yeah, and I like that. I like it a lot. Mason wants to make sure he's also calm for his afternoon lessons. He shows me his new routine. I'm starting to understand how big a change is possible for the tens of thousands of kids taking drugs for ADHD. This is the evidence that a child with ADHD can, with admittedly a lot of effort, have a really productive, joyful day at school without drugs. And watching him gobble down his lunch and saying how weird that was for him, that, that, you know, that makes me feel the urgency of this more than ever. How's your day been? Um, I would like to say relaxing, but I've been a bit anxious. Well? There's nothing to be anxious about. He's been focused. He's came in, um, understood the maths very quickly. Basically, amazing. he was amazing. <laughs> wow. It, you know, I walked in that classroom and you would never, if you said, if, like, if everyone in that class, who's the kid with ADHD? No, no idea, no idea. Couldn't have wished for it to have gone better, I suppose. Hello. 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 How are you? <laughs> Hello. Did you have a good day? Yeah. That is really good. Give me a cuddle. Well I'm done. done. I heard how you've been. Do you feel like you could do that again? Yeah. You weren't fidgeting and jumping around? Mm -hmm. Wow. Different Mason. I'm surprised. I've been saying that Sunday and Monday, no tablet. That is a brilliant idea because it means that you've got one day at school and one day at home. I know. That's what I was saying. Why do you want to stop taking your pill two days a week? Is it just to shut me up because I'm making my tele program? No, no. It's, it's so, I can, so I can literally be myself, not take the tablet and be someone else. So you feel like the tablet makes you yeah. someone else? But to not taking it, it makes me me as I was born. As you were born? Yeah. I'm halfway through exploring why we're relying more and more on pills to treat our kids. I'm more convinced than ever that while there are drugs that improve and save children's lives, many of the medications that we're giving don't work well and they have severe side effects. 
And we have to be really aware of those harms. We have to question that basic assumption that drugs are a good way of solving children's problems. There are alternatives. I've seen that they can work. And yes, they're often hard to do, and they need huge amounts more research. But for the sake of our children's health, we have to demand more. Next time, I discover the massive rise in teenagers taking antidepressants, 58,000, and look for alternatives that work. I feel a bit like a caveman. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> where the drugs are failing. You found that only one of all these 14 antidepressants was better than taking a sugar pill. I look at a prescription given to babies that's rocketed by 500%. We were just put through an absolute nightmare for what I see now was no reason. As I try to understand why we're giving our kids more and more medication. <laughs>